One of the most common myths that I hear is that if unused, muscle tissue converts into fat. From pregnancy myths. Pregnant women shouldn't pet cats. This is a myth. To myths about going gluten-free in order to lose weight. Gluten-free for weight loss can be a huge marketing ploy. There are tons of misconceptions when it comes to the human body. Whether it's about exercise or mental illness, a lot of the stuff that you hear isn't exactly true. We had experts visit our studio to debunk some of the most common myths in the world of health and well-being. First up, we have two experts debunk 15 of the most common myths about sleep. All right, many adults need five hours of sleep or less. Now, this is a myth. Loud snoring is annoying, but mostly harmless. Loud snoring is actually a sign that there is a blockage in your throat. Your brain and body will adapt to less sleep. This is a myth. I'm Dr. Rebecca Robbins. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And I'm Dr. David Rappaport. I'm a professor of medicine at uh, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and I run the research program in sleep. And we're here today to debunk some of the most common myths about our sleep. Watching TV in bed is a good way to relax before sleep. Now, this is not something that we would necessarily recommend. You turn the television on, and if it's close to you, that's a source of bright blue light. So bright light is one of the strongest cues to our circadian rhythm. It kickstarts our body and our brain uh, to become awake and alert in the morning. It's called a Zeitgerber, the, the strongest input to that circadian, the awake phase of our rhythm. Drinking booze before bed will improve your sleep. So this is a very commonly used tactic for people who have trouble sleeping and they have a drink. It's a drug. It's very much like a sleeping pill. And it is true that it will help you get to sleep as long as you don't drink too much, one or two drinks perhaps. What you do, however, is it disrupts the normal sleep. It suppresses REM sleep, which is a normal part of your sleep that comes on a little while after you go to sleep, typically 30 to 60 minutes later. And then when it comes that the alcohol has gotten out of your system, then the REM comes back, perhaps at the wrong time, perhaps too strong, and it disrupts things. And so basically, it is not generally recommended that alcohol be used as a sleeping pill. Lying in bed with your eyes closed is almost as good as sleeping. I think that one's pretty definitely not correct. Sleep is a very specific process that your body goes through. The most common myth, if you will, that we got rid of in the scientific field uh, 50 years ago is that sleep was like you know taking your car and putting it in the garage and turning off the key and leaving it there and, and then you come back the next morning and it just is parked. Sleep is not like that at all. Sleep is a very active process. When you go to sleep, you enter one stage. A little while later, you enter another stage. It gets progressively deeper. You then have the REM sleep, and then you wake up momentarily, and that whole cycle takes an hour to an hour and a half, and then it starts again, and it happens three to five times in a night. And if you disrupt any of that, something happens, and the next morning, you feel it. You don't feel rested. Now, we don't understand how that actually happens or why that happens, but we do know it does happen. So when you're lying in bed, none of that is happening if your eyes are closed and you're not asleep. It just doesn't count. Next. If you can't sleep, you should stay in bed and try to fall back asleep. If you don't fall asleep, we generally recommend that you not stretch it out by and stress yourself out by just trying. And there's probably nothing that can prevent sleep as well as I've got to go to sleep. <laughs> I've got to go to sleep. I've got to go I to sleep. I need to. You can feel your <laughs> pulse and your blood pressure going up. So what we try and do when we work with somebody who has this problem with insomnia is exactly the opposite of that. We try and tell them, relax, don't worry about it, stay in bed for a little while and see what happens. But don't try to go to sleep, just relax. And if you can't relax and if you don't go to sleep, it's probably better to get up so that you don't associate the bed with a stressful situation. All right, many adults need five hours of sleep or less. Now, this is a myth. We have scores of epidemiological data and data from the sleep lab to show that five hours is not enough for the vast majority of adults. There may be some individuals that maybe do okay on, on six hours, but much less than that really is a myth. Now, you might hear people brag about this, saying, you know, oh, 
I do, you know, I get five, I'm just fine. But by and large, we do see those people likely making up for lost sleep on the weekends or, or in power naps, for instance. So for the vast majority of us, uh, it, the recommendation really is seven, seven to eight hours. This is a real problem with the sleep field has been trying to address, and that is that not sleeping has been perceived as a macho thing. It proves how great you are, uh, it proves how manly you are in some cases. Sleeping is actually good. You should sort of be proud of the fact that you sleep to your need. Your brain and body will adapt to less sleep. That sounds like yours. <laughs> no, this is a myth. We see that just like good nutrition or a great healthy diet is so important, we similarly have a diet that we need, our brains and our bodies, to be at their best. There are actual sleep. formal studies that have tested how people perform mm -hmm. with lack of sleep and how they think mm -hmm. they are performing. And it turns out that we basically are really lousy at saying how sleepy we are. So you know you feel bad when you haven't had enough sleep, but you have no idea how bad you are. And your performance keeps deteriorating the more you don't sleep or, or re restrict your sleep over multiple days. And you think, oh, I've settled in. I, you know, I have a little headache and it doesn't really bother me. I'm doing just <laughs> great. And what actually is happening is you're performing less and less well on the various things that we can test, including driving simulators. You're falling asleep for three or four seconds continuously without knowing it. All right, it doesn't matter what time of day you sleep. If you look at our biology, we have inside our brain a clock. That clock is set to say this is a good time to sleep and then at another time it says this is a good time to be out. Sleep is timed. It doesn't just happen. And even if you don't sleep for the whole night, you'll be more and more sleepy all night long, but in the morning you'll get a second wind. And that's because the clock says, up, oh, time to be up. Doesn't matter that you didn't sleep, it's time to be up. As Rebecca said, we've gained an incredible ability to not abide by that rhythm. And the problem is that people think that they can get away with things that our biology just won't let us do. Nurses have been most studied for this, and firefighters and emergency workers and people who live on ships, they all pay a price epidemiologically. We've shown higher heart disease and more tendency to gain weight and a variety of malfunctions and difficulties as time goes on. You can do it, but it's gonna cost you. Exercising within four hours of bedtime will disturb your sleep. What we give as advice is that about an hour before sleep, you wanna try and avoid active kind of things, and exercise certainly is one of them. On the other hand, there are people who exercise close to sleep and do very well. So I don't think we should say, you know, if you're somebody who exercises regularly in the evening and you sleep beautifully and you feel rested the next morning, that you should give up exercise because I think that would be a bad bit of advice. You'll gain weight, you'll lose the toning that you've got, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, if you haven't been doing it, I probably wouldn't start exercising at night. And if you're having trouble with sleep, that's one of the first things we look at after drugs like caffeine to try and get rid of. All right, remembering your dreams is a sign of a good night's sleep. I think that there is a huge variation in how much people remember their dreams. Some of it has to do with when you wake up. If you wake up during REM sleep, you almost always will remember a dream. Some of us don't remember anything at all about our dreams and it doesn't seem to harm them, but it's not a true thing that, that just because you don't remember your dreams that you're not having good sleep. What tells you you're having good sleep is how you feel the next day. Now if you're waking up with nightmares, that could be a simple sign that maybe your bedroom is too hot and yep. you need to turn down the temperature because a, a hot bedroom environment unfortunately can create fragmented sleep and uh, cause you to wake up often from nightmares. Now, um, eating cheese or other food before bed causes nightmares. I don't think I'm aware of any particular food that will do that to everybody. But it's very clear that being uncomfortable will precipitate both bad sleep and waking up and maybe even nightmares. So imagine somebody with irritable bowel syndrome who knows that whenever they eat whatever, gluten or, 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 or some specific food, spicy foods, it upsets their stomach when they're awake. Well, guess what? If they eat it before they go to sleep, it'll upset their sleep and it may show up as a nightmare. Loud snoring is annoying, but mostly harmless. Loud snoring is actually a sign that there is a blockage in your throat. The mildest form of block, it just causes vibration, noise. If you've ever, you know, played sort of, you know, with a piece of grass and you blow through it, you know that if you blow through a tube or a structure that can vibrate, 
it starts to vibrate and make noise. Many instruments are based on exactly that principle. You're creating a vibration by blowing through a partially blocked tube. So snoring is just that. And if that's all it was, it wouldn't be all that bad for you. But unfortunately, it usually isn't just by itself. And especially when, as they say on the question, loud snoring, that kind of snoring, and especially if it's associated with gasps and snorts and pauses, is actually a sign of a very common disorder called sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is when that blockage gets a little bit worse than just causing vibration and actually blocks the flow of air in. And when that happens, you're actually choking. And when that gets complete, we call it an apnea without breathing from the Greek. And your body defends itself against this blockage by waking up because everything gets normal when you wake up. The trouble is that then you go back to sleep and it happens again and it can happen every 30 to 60 seconds. Hitting snooze bar is better than getting up. We often hear that people have two, three, four, or five alarms set up before they get up in the morning. Now, the best thing for all of us to do would actually be to practice sleep hygiene and have a consistent bedtime and, and actually wake up with an alarm. But of course, that's a lot harder in, um, in actuality. The best thing for us, by and large, is to set your alarm clock for the latest time that you can in the morning to allow for as much sleep as possible, but that will allow you to go about your daily routine and, and get to work on time. Because if we're hitting several snooze bars and waiting, I think, I believe it's nine minutes and then another nine minutes. All of that incremental sleep is, is very rarely that. It's much more fragmented. It's very light sleep, if anything. And the majority of REM sleep is in the morning, right before we wake up. So try to protect that as best you can and set your alarm clock for the latest possible time. You can simply become a morning person. So the, the, the difference between a morning and an evening person appears to be influenced by lots of things that are probably genetic. And it's not something you can just change by training. What you can do is trick your biology into thinking that you live in Chicago, but you work in New York. And that's what blue light does. With some uh, blue light therapy, actually, using bright blue light uh, in the morning can help shift those true evening people a little bit earlier. It, it basically tells you that you're actually in a different time zone from where you are, and that shifts you a little bit. So that's the approach we use when the problem is severe, and there's a need for that. It's actually shifting when morning is, rather than shifting whether you work in the morning. So uh, you can catch up on sleep by sleeping in on the weekends. Now, uh, for the vast majority of us, this is a very common practice, this kind of sleeping in. And, and unfortunately, in our society, we, we term it as this luxury, you know, oh, to sleep in. And that's because most of us aren't getting enough sleep during the work week. We're adding bricks into our backpack of sleep debt. Now, what sleeping in does is it sends a cue to our, our circadian rhythm that we're trying to change time zones. So if we we extend our rising time by more than an hour, two, three, worse, four hours into the morning. You might feel better than if you got up early, but that sleep the next night is going to be compromised. Why? We call this social jet lag. Our body is trying to adapt. If you're a New Yorker, you're physiologically, your body is, it thinks you're in London and you're trying to adjust to that time. So you're going to be fighting your physiology come bedtime that next night. So the best practice is to keep a consistent bedtime schedule and try to get as much sleep as you can. Now, if you do have an excessive sleep debt and you, you really need to pay that back on the weekends, the best way without interrupting your circadian rhythm would be to do that with a nap in the afternoon because that's not gonna change your, your body's physiological circadian uh, rhythm. Boredom makes you tired even if you got enough sleep. Now, yes, it is very true that a boring meeting or lecture, especially in the afternoon, may be soporific, but if you're in that environment and sleep deprived, it is a bellwether sign that you're not getting enough sleep. So when people say, you know, oh, the airport, you know, the airplane makes me tired. I get in the plane and I, I fall right asleep. Boredom alone, of course, is not a sleep, you know, inducing state. Boredom is a mask is a way of unmasking your sleep tendency. We, in fact, use that in testing. We put people in boring situations and see how long it takes them to fall asleep. If they are fully satisfying their sleep need, they don't fall asleep for at least 20 minutes. 
Sleep is so, so critical to our health and our wellness and our, our well-being, and every night does count. In light of all the things that we've talked about, remember that you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So do try to implement some of the strategies or put some of the strategies to work that we've talked about today if you find that you have a problem. Um, because at the end of the day, small changes do make a, a really big difference, especially when it comes to our sleep. One of the most common myths that I hear is that if unused, muscle tissue converts into fat. It's really important to say that muscle tissue has muscle cells and fat tissue has fat cells. They are not interchangeable. By no means is it chemically or physically possible for muscle tissue to convert over to fat and vice versa, fat into muscle. That's Sean Kiekenmeister. I'm a clinical athletic trainer at the New York Sports Science Lab in Staten Island, New York. And he's one of three athletic trainers we brought into our studios. My name's Janiel Mason. My name is Andy Stern. To debunk 17 of the most common exercise myths. It really depends on your goals. Training fasted in the morning is more conducive to losing fat because when you wake up, you're in a fasted state. And that means your body is basically consuming itself. So it's looking at fat storage, it's looking at muscle storage. That's the time where if your goal is to lose weight and just slim down, lean down, that's the best time to optimize that window for training. But in terms of effectiveness of training in general, I don't think it really matters. You just need to make sure that if you are training at night, you are not fatiguing yourself throughout the day. So when most people think stretching, they're thinking static stretching. You achieve a certain position, you hold that position, and your goal is to increase your range of motion. The problem with that is you can end up really loose. And if you follow that type of stretching with something explosive or something ballistic or something strength-based, you now have a loose tissue or you have a lax joint and you're not going to be able to produce as much force and you could also potentially lead yourself to being injured because you're not as stable. So one of my favorite is is when it's the holidays, right? And you have you have that aunt or uncle that's just like, hey, I'm just trying to lose it like right here. And they start pinching the lower abdomen. I'm like, oh great. You can't spot reduce the part that you want. And in good news, it doesn't go the other way either. It's not like when I eat a cheeseburger, it's gonna go right to my right hip. And if you are trying to lower your body fat, cardio isn't the best way to do it. Cardio doesn't burn fat, cardio burns calories. So if your goal is to lose weight, you want to be in a caloric deficit. So as a part of getting into that caloric deficit, doing cardiovascular exercises is helpful. But if you're not eating a diet or if you're not monitoring your caloric intake on top of that and making sure that you are in that deficit, no amount of cardio that you do, you can't outrun a bad diet. And in fact, doing too much cardio can actually be a bad thing. If all you're doing is cardio with the goal of losing weight, you can start to burn into that muscle tissue. So if you're burning into your lean muscle tissue now, you could actually be slowing down your metabolism. You could be decreasing your bone density and you could be making yourself weaker. And that's why I think this myth is potentially the most dangerous and damaging one for the general population. But it may not be as common as the belief that I love this one. One myth I hear all the time is that muscle weighs more than fat. A pound of bricks weighs the same as a pound of feathers. So it's not that muscle weighs more than fat, it's that muscle is more dense than fat. So in terms of you building muscle, you can add weight on the scale. The scale isn't necessarily the best indicator of progress when we're trying to develop our physique. And oftentimes at first, you can add muscle and the scale will reflect that you're heavier. But over time, understanding that for all the lean muscle you have, you're increasing your resting calories burned per day. That's a long-term sustainable change in your body as opposed to just doing cardio sessions and going into caloric deficit and starving yourself. Of course, building muscle isn't just for men. Women think that they'll bulk up if they start working out, and if that's the look you're going for, I think that's great because you're doing something that you want to do. But if you are working out for general wellness and health, I don't want you to be afraid to lift heavy weights. You're not going to get bulky by nature. And in fact, weightlifting is especially important for women. As we age, we become more prone to getting osteoporosis. So we definitely need to be doing resistance training where our muscles are feeling that stimulation 
so that the bones nearby can remain strong. And whether you're a man or a woman, you don't actually need weights at all to build strength. I mean, the myth being that you have to go to the gym to be doing strength training, it's crazy, right? Your body is a weight. So body weight exercises have been around forever and they are so important to be able to push up your body or crunch or squat or pull up. And if it's a six pack you're after, the muscles themselves aren't even that important. Getting a six pack is not about doing tons of crunches. A lot of it has to do with your nutrition. And Stern agrees. Abs are made in the kitchen. The abs are a muscle. If you're gonna target the muscle by doing crunches, leg lifts, bicycle crunches, oblique twists, you're essentially building the muscle. So think of it as you're building the engine of the car and then the outside is your body fat. And how do you show off the inside of the car? You've got to reduce that body fat. So sweating a lot means you got a really great workout is something I hear all the time. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true either. Uh, some people are just naturally more prone to sweating. Some people just have underactive sweat glands. So it means that you're healthy in your filtration system, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the effectiveness of your workout. But if you do sweat a lot, how should you replenish? I would not say that most commercial sports drinks are the most efficient way of rehydrating following a workout. But plain water isn't going to cut it either. If you're just consuming water too, that's also not the most effective way of hydrating because hydration is not just water. There's also trace minerals that uh, act as electrolytes, which help with nerve conduction, they help with brain function, they help with muscular contraction. So if you're looking for the best way to rehydrate post-workout, it could be very beneficial to add just a dab of pink Himalayan sea salt to water. The pink Himalayan sea salt has over 60 trace minerals, all of which are found naturally in human sweat. So when you consider something like a Gatorade or a Powerade, they may have four or five different electrolytes in their blends. So they're falling drastically short in terms of overall hydration when it comes to all the minerals in your body. And after a workout, you should also eat protein immediately, right? If you already have a protein-rich diet, you don't need to worry so much about downing a protein shake right after your workout. Now, what you are going to be depleted of, though, especially if you're doing anaerobic exercise, you're going to be depleted of glycogen. Glycogen is the immediate form of energy for muscle contraction, and that comes in way of simple car carbohydrates and sugars. So post-training, it's important to replenish that glycogen. But even if you're fueling muscles with a proper diet, they still need time off. Hashtag no days off. The old myth um, that we should not take a day off is um, an extreme. There's a huge value in letting the muscle repair itself, right? So every time you do, let's go back to the bicep curl. If I'm doing a bicep curl, a small tear is gonna happen in my bicep. So the body is going to repair itself because again, it's a machine and it knows how to, to survive. And if I continue to do it, I don't have a window of opportunity for the body, the soldiers to jump in and be like, all right, let's fix this tear because it's just constantly being worked. So it needs some of that downtime um, to, again, to heal itself. Especially if you're sore. That's a myth for sure. Soreness is the breakdown of muscle tissue. It's the chemicals released during that breakdown. It's not an indicator of, oh, I'm getting stronger, or oh, I'm getting weaker. But if your soreness persists for longer than 72 hours, that could be a sign that you're under-recovering or overtraining. One month, is not enough to undo a lifetime of bad habits. So it's important to start slow, find the things that you enjoy, find the physical activities that make you feel good, make that a daily habit. And there's no one size fits all approach. There's not one type of movement that you should be doing that is better than the other. So if you enjoy dancing, go out and dance. Go out dancing three times a week or do a dance cardio class or something that gets you moving. If you like to jump on trampolines, do that. I think the best movement for anyone to do is something that they enjoy because the only way that you're gonna stick to your workout, being a lifestyle for you, is for you to be doing something you enjoy. Pregnant women need to eat twice as much. Absolute myth, don't do it. You really actually only need about 200 extra calories a day over a normal American diet, and that's assuming that you're starting pregnancy at a normal weight. Sex during pregnancy hurts the baby. Well. Cocoa butter prevents stretch marks. This is a myth. I'm Laura Riley. I'm a high-risk OB at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wild Cornell.
I'm Dina Goffman. I'm a high-risk OB at New York Presbyterian Columbia. This is so exciting. I'm wondering what's going to come next. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Oh, my favorite. It's okay to drink a glass of wine when you're pregnant. We know that the recommendation in pregnancy is that you really should not consume any alcohol. Unfortunately, there is no safe amount of alcohol nor a safe time in pregnancy when we can be sure that alcohol won't affect a developing fetus. Also, I think it's important to add that uh, we don't think it's safe to drink while you're breastfeeding either because the alcohol does get into breast milk. And as Dr. Goffman said, we don't know what the safe amount is, and that safe amount may actually change for different women. Your belly reveals the baby's gender. We certainly hear patients coming in to see us and having heard or having family members say that they can tell whether you're having a boy or a girl based on how um, the woman's belly looks. And we know that there is absolutely no evidence that the shape of your belly can tell us um, this type of information. The other myth that goes along with gender, I think, is the heart rate's high or low. My patients always say that. You know, they come in, oh, it's 160, it must be a girl. Like, no. If it's 160, it means the kid's moving a lot. And if it's sleeping, it's gonna be 120. So it doesn't tell you whether it's a girl or a boy. Cocoa butter prevents stretch marks. This is a myth. Um, while cocoa butter um, is something that many patients like to use, um, we don't have any evidence that, that cocoa butter or anything else that we can recommend will prevent stretch marks. It's probably genetic, and essentially, if you gain too much weight in one spot, i.e. your pregnancy gets really big, you're more likely to get stretch marks, unfortunately. But it's not worth spending a ton of money on expensive creams, because it's not gonna work. That was cheery. <laughs> you can give a cold to your developing baby. This is a complete myth. Your baby is not gonna get the cold, um, although your baby can get sick if you get um, something like the flu, which is why we tell you to get a flu shot to prevent your baby from getting really sick. There are some illnesses that you can transfer to your baby, but probably not a cold. I think people get the cold and the flu confused, which is, which is unfortunate, because the flu can make you really sick in pregnancy. What you eat during pregnancy can influence the baby's palate. I don't think there is a shred of evidence to support that. I think that what you eat during pregnancy is important because it does sort of, you know, set your baby off to um, a good start in terms of its overall nutrition and good health. Um, but it's probably not going to change the baby's palate. We always talk about nutrition and food choices and healthy weight gain, which really can have long-term impact on your baby's development, but not specifically the palate or what they have a taste for. Pregnant women shouldn't drink coffee. That's a myth. You can drink coffee. This is one where moderation is, is the most important thing. In the first trimester, having excessive amounts of coffee have been associated with a higher risk of miscarriage. Once that first trimester is over, should you go crazy with the coffee? Probably not, but it's not going to harm anything. Pregnant women shouldn't eat hot dogs. So this is a myth. I think um, the concern with hot dogs are a few. You wanna make sure that they are well cooked to avoid infection risk. Um, and there used to be a fair amount of conversation about the amount of nitrites in hot dogs, but I think the evidence suggests that unless you're eating really excessive amounts of hot dogs, that it's probably okay to enjoy one. I think there are probably things better than hot dogs to eat nutritionally, but I think if people enjoy one once in a while, uh, I don't have a problem with it. You're not way nicer than I am. I'm not sure why anybody's eating hot dogs, frankly, but, you know, you can have one in, in pregnancy. But I think it's really important to make sure that it's cooked because the concern about listeria um, is a real concern. So that includes the hot dogs, the unpasteurized cheeses, the deli meats, all of those things are things that we worry about. So I think, you know, yeah, it's a myth that you can't eat hot dogs, but you should be certain that it's cooked well. Pregnant women shouldn't eat smoked salmon. That's a myth. You can eat smoked salmon if you like it. I'm not a lover of salmon, so. I love it. You can eat smoked salmon. <laughs> this know. gets into concerns around fish consumption in pregnancy, which is a huge topic. And we talk to our patients about the risk of various types of fish. So we want to avoid fish with high mercury content. So typically that would be avoding excessive tuna, choosing chunk light, um, 
canned tuna and also limiting the number of cans of tuna in a week. There is also some concern about some of these oily fish, I guess, about the potential for toxins. And so I would say salmon in general may fall into that category, but smoked salmon, um, I think, is safe for pregnant women to eat. The whole fish story is a little blown out of proportion, and I think people get really crazy about this whole mercury thing. I would say it's important to also recognize, though, that fish has great nutritional value to it. Um, that pregnant women and babies need and want. So it, it is unfortunate that somehow the fish story has you know, resulted in people thinking, I can't have any fish. It's really the large snake fishes where you're worried about the mercury, but then don't forget that something like salmon is gonna give you the DHEAS, which you want. Pregnant women shouldn't pet cats. This is a myth. This would be terrible if all pregnant women in the world couldn't pet their pets, their cats. There is a concern with pregnant women caring for cats in terms of the litter box, and really the risk is toxoplasmosis, and the risk of exposure isn't with interacting with your cat, but with changing a dirty litter box. It is actually fairly rare in the U.S. for women to come into contact with toxoplasmosis. The more important thing about um, sort of the cat story is everyone worries about the cat and the kitty litter, the most common exposure that women get to toxoplasmosis is actually not the cat or the litter even. It's um, not washing your garden vegetables because it's the cat that has the toxo that poops in your garden and then you pick that up and eat it because you don't wash it or whatever. So gardening without gloves um, are things that we tell pregnant women to, to avoid because of that particular infection. The cat's got a bad rap, unfortunately. Pregnant women shouldn't fly. Total myth, get on the plane, have a good time. That said, uh, there are a few things to think about when flying. I think uh, one of the major issues is that pregnant women are at increased risk for getting a blood clot, either in their leg or their lung. When you fly, uh, the air is dry. You're also more likely just to be sitting for a prolonged period of time. And that just in further increases your risk for getting a blood clot. So I always tell pregnant women, be happy, go ahead, go on those you know, trips. Um, but you should hydrate before you go. You should wear support hose or at least like, you know, running tights or something that gives you a little bit of um, support in your legs. You should get up and walk around every hour or so. People worry about the air pressure, which makes no sense because it's a pressurized cabin. That doesn't do anything. You're not gonna break your water. And they also worry about going through the screener, right? Um, everybody's worried about the uh, radiation going through the screener, but in fact, the radiation exposure is actually higher when you're in the sky in the plane than it is when you're walking quickly through the, those, through the security. Exercise during pregnancy can strangle the baby. This is a myth. Uh, exercise is actually strongly recommended during pregnancy. All of our professional organizations, all of us as providers, talk to patients about maintaining physical activity, maintaining exercise throughout the pregnancy, really unless there's a medical situation that comes up that changes those recommendations. So exercise is not dangerous, and in fact, the opposite. It's really important. I think also this whole strangling thing comes from this crazy nonsense that if you get yourself into certain yoga positions, your baby can strangle itself. You don't have any control over the position your baby gets into. The baby is floating in a pool of water, and it doesn't matter whether you're doing a headstand or you're just like, Chilling. Sex during pregnancy hurts the baby. Well, that's a big myth, and it also helps to understand sort of the anatomy a little bit. I think this is where patients get a little bit confused. The baby is floating inside a pool of water, a big balloon bag, and that balloon bag is surrounded by thick muscle, which is the uterus, surrounds the entire bag, and has actually a thicker portion at the bottom. So there's just no way that sex is gonna get even near the baby. Dyeing your hair is harmful for the baby. This is another big myth, and we get phone calls about it, lots of questions. There is no evidence, and again, we keep coming back to evidence because it's what we look to as your physicians, and there really is no evidence out there that the things that we use for hair dyeing reach the baby or have the potential to cause harm. The other thing about the hair dye, frankly, I tell people, if it's gonna make you feel better, that's really important. 
because um, for a lot of us, how we look and how we present ourselves really has a lot to do with our psychological state and you want that to be as healthy as possible during pregnancy. There are simple tricks to overcome morning sickness. I think that that's a myth in the sense that none of those things are probably simple, but I think there are ways to um, sort of decrease the painfulness of morning sickness. The first thing is, is that the morning sickness can last all day, so the whole morning thing is a myth in and of itself. But that said, some of the things that you can do to help it, try and start the day with something really simple like soda crackers the minute you get out of bed, salt something really bland. Stay away from the smells. The smells are going to make you sicker. I think the biggest thing that I've learned over the course of my career and had personal um, involvement with this one is we tell people to stay hydrated and so they go after the water bottle and stay away from the water. The water makes you sick. I don't understand it, but it makes you sick. So what I tell patients is put everything over crushed ice. That way you'll get the water, but you're not actually drinking it and gulping air as you're drinking out of a water bottle. The things that I would put over ice, I would say lemonade, ginger ale, letting some of the fizz out um, will help as well. Lemon popsicles, lemon slush, lemon Italian ice. The reason I say lemon is because lemon helps cut the nausea as well. I think the other critical thing for morning sickness is it's important to go out every day. I think sometimes what happens is you feel a little bit nauseous, then you feel worse, then you start to feel depressed, and then you can't get yourself moving because you're tired. And that's the worst thing you can do is to sort of give in to it. I think it's important to get outside, walk around, even if it's just down the block and back. C-sections are always necessary for breech births. So this is a myth. Although I think most of us think C-sections are the most common and the safest way to deliver um, a singleton, so a single baby in labor, especially at term. So there are certainly situations that we need to be able to individualize for. Often we'll talk to patients with twins if the second twin is breached, that may be a great option for them. And I think there are rare situations where a woman comes in in labor where we may recommend and or support a vaginal breach delivery for a singleton. I think in order to support a vaginal breach delivery, you need to have a provider who has experience doing that. And you know, the reality is, is that in the U.S., the number of providers that are able to do this safely is definitely diminishing, um, almost to none. I think the other option though, which I think we should put out there on the table, is aversion, which is if you know the baby is breech and you're at term, is coming in for a procedure where we, under ultrasound guidance, turn the baby to head down. If you sit all day, you'll have a breech baby. Total myth. If you sit all day, you'll gain a lot of weight and you'll have back pain but your baby will do whatever your baby is gonna do. Most babies are not breech at full term. So only about this is like 3% of babies are gonna be breech um, at full term. Most babies are gonna turn uh, multiple times until they get to around 36 or 37 weeks. And so it has nothing to do with whether you're running a marathon or you're sitting on your bottom. Pregnant <laughs> women should sleep on their left side. I think pregnant women should sleep how they're comfortable, although we know that women, as they get more pregnant into the second and certainly in the third trimester, may not be able to sleep flat on their back. And that's because as the pregnancy grows, the fetus grows, the uterus grows, the weight that the uterus will put on your blood vessels and some other structures may make that really uncomfortable. Um, and not ideal for the baby. So women can sleep on their left side, they can sleep on their right side, they can sleep on their back tilted a little bit, but um, we usually aren't so strict as to say left side only. I think people worry that, um, oh my gosh, I woke up and I'm flat on my back, did I kill my baby? You didn't kill your baby. If you sleep you know, flat on your back, as um, Dr. Goffman said, the structure we're most worried about is the inferior vena cava, so it's this big blood vessel bringing blood back up to your heart and your head, and most people are gonna get really nauseous, right? Um, and lightheaded and feel weird, and so you'll naturally turn. So you don't have to wake yourself up to do it. Your hair and skin look better when you're pregnant. <laughs> I wish. Your hair might look better, I guess. 
your skin probably won't necessarily look better. Some women say they glow. I think that they're, <laughs> they're dreaming. Unfortunately, the high progesterone levels that you get when you're pregnant to support the pregnancy actually um, can really bring out acne that you haven't seen since you were 13 years old. And all the expensive creams in the world are not gonna fix that. So I wouldn't suggest that you spend your money on it. Pregnant women get flexible. You know, we recognize there are lots of changes going on in women's bodies when they're pregnant, but I wouldn't say that getting flexible is one of them. There are certain things that happen in terms of your posture, how you stand, and definitely some relaxation of different parts of your body to prepare your pelvis um, to be able to have a vaginal birth, but I don't think that sort of traditional flexibility is what we typically see. Eating spicy foods will induce labor. <laughs> So if this were true, that would be wonderful because we could help women, um, you know, induce labor when we wanted to. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to come up with any particular food or physical activity or drink or supplement that actually can induce labor. We have medications to use to induce labor, but as far as we've been able to tell, there's no evidence that any of those things that women may want to try actually will be effective. I think people are just looking for something to get out of Dodge at 40 weeks, which I can totally relate yeah. to. <laughs> it's it not going to hurt. It's probably not going to hurt. The spicy food probably won't hurt. You can do whatever you want, but your baby's in charge. Just remember that. Yoga can induce labor. We think there are a lot of benefits to potentially doing yoga and participating in pregnancy, but inducing labor isn't one of them. Certainly more women are using yoga, which may help with relaxation, may help with stress relief, may help with stretching. And so I think there are a lot of reasons why yoga may be a, a great thing to participate in, but there's no evidence that it induces labor. If only. Yoga makes labor smoother. I think overall, Exercise probably gives you a better labor in the sense that it is usually more efficient, but yoga itself not necessarily making it smoother. There are some things about yoga that are similar to other labor preparation or childbirth preparation things, right? Breathing, mindfulness, I think are similar to some childbirth preparation things. So I think in that sense, some of those things may help you to be more centered, be able to focus, be able to use some of those strategies to help, but certainly um, not make labor itself smoother. Natural births are better. So this is a myth. There are certainly women who um, spend time thinking about what they'd like their birth experience to be like. And I think for some women, natural birth, and the way we think about that is usually birth without pain medication. And for some women, this may be a wonderful experience, but we all know that we need to individualize the care for our patients. And for many women, a natural birth may not be better. There may be real medical benefits depending on the situation and underlying condition to having pain medication, to having an epidural. I'm a huge fan of natural childbirth, I have to say, um, but I do think that it takes some preparation, and I think it takes mental preparation, and I think that it's not better or worse. I also think that there's, there is a, another myth associated with natural childbirth, which is that uh, if you're induced, you have to have anesthesia because the pain is worse. The pain is bad whether we give you the contractions or your kid gives you the contractions or it happens naturally, whatever. It's painful. And some people can um, cope better because they've practiced mindfulness or hypnobirthing or whatever. And then sometimes people can just cope better because it's faster. But again, I think it's all about everybody can make their own birth choices. There, I love this one. There are ways to predict your exact due date. When we give you your due date, it's plus or minus two weeks. And the reason is because your kid's in charge of when you go into labor. We are not. Though I have to say, are much more precise in knowing what your dates are than we used to be because we use ultrasound, early, early ultrasound so much more frequently. Obviously there's those people who have done IVF and they know even more. Um, but again, even if you know when it all started, you do not know when it will all end um, because the person who knows that is your baby and we can't at the moment um, talk with that person. One of the biggest myths that I get from my clients is that 
and need to skip meals and starve in order to lose weight. It's not true. So if you skip meals, it's going to have such a negative effect on your body that when you do go to sit down and eat, you'll probably overconsume. That's Lorraine Kearney, one of three dietitians we brought into our studios. My name is Ryan Turner. My name is Nikita Kapoor. To debunk 18 of the most common weight loss myths. The biggest myth that frustrates me the most is that all calories are created equally. A calorie is not just a calorie. It depends on the source of your calories, whether it's coming from caloric dense foods or nutritional dense foods. Caloric dense foods would be more so our cookies, our cakes. We can have a cookie that's 100 calories. We'll eat it, it'll digest really fast. Then it's gonna spike our blood sugar levels where when we start to crash again, we're gonna crave more sugar for that energy pick-me-up. And that, can make you gain weight. On the other hand, you can have a banana. Which is an example of a nutritionally dense food. I get the question a lot, do bananas make you fat? Bananas do not make you fat. Bananas are a great source of potassium, but for those 100 calories, you're also gonna get the fiber and the nutrients that your body needs on that cellular level to make sure that you are healthy and that you're nourished. And you definitely need to nourish your body if you're trying to lose weight. When we are restricting calories, you are restricting the energy source of your body. You're also restricting the energy source of your brain. And if that's happening, then, you know, very primitive, protective mechanisms start to kick into place where your body senses that as a physiological threat and does start to shift your metabolic balance to burn less because it's getting less. It's kind of like a, a budget, right? So if you have a paycheck um, and you're running out of funds, you're going to conserve how much you pay till your next paycheck. Your body does the same. You your body will jump into this protective physiological, biological mechanism to reduce the amount of energy you're using, which is why it is hard for people to maintain weight. And starving yourself can also shrink your muscles. You want to make sure that you're not eating less than 70% of your overall calorie needs. If you do, that's where not only are you probably going to feel extremely hungry and it's going to take you off of any goals that you're setting, but you're probably going to start compromising your muscle mass as well, and that's where weight loss is going to be unhealthy. But while the amount of calories you consume matters, the timing might not. Timing of meals is always a big question. Everyone comes to me and they kind of smirk and they think that I'm going to give them a thumbs up when they say, I don't eat after 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And I say, oh, all right, <laughs> do you enjoy that? And they say, no. And I say, well, then maybe eating after is okay. Because timing of day is not going to affect weight loss. Calories are what's going to affect weight loss or body fat loss. So if you eat a bunch of additional calories and you're in calorie surplus and those are coming late at night, then that's what's causing something like waking. And what about eating first thing in the morning? It depends on the body and it depends on the person and their relationship with food. For a lot of people, me included, if I don't eat a meal, I usually feel like very deprived and it's like I want to make up for it later. If that happens, then that's where we can add in like a lot of calories. Personally, I'm a huge advocate of breakfast. Our body runs on fuel and food is our fuel. So if we have our breakfast, then we feel we have more sustained energy throughout the day. And if you do choose to eat breakfast, feel free to go for that 2% yogurt. Now fat is incredibly necessary. We should not be afraid of fat. We need fat in the diet. Fat's gonna be necessary for things like absorbing nutrients, like the fat-soluble nutrients, like vitamin A and D and E and K. And you also need to make sure that fat, specifically cholesterol, is what's gonna help produce things like your hormones. So things like estrogen and testosterone, growth hormones. So we need all those kind of things. Not only is fat healthy, but fat-free foods are often loaded with sugar or salt. So if you have a wholesome product and you're removing the fat of it, it's gonna taste completely different. You probably wouldn't even like it, but what they're gonna do is replace that flavor with something else. And usually it's either sodium or sugar. So with sugar, when we have like a yogurt that has the fruit at the bottom, they're gonna have way more sugars than if you had like a 2% Greek yogurt. And as it turns out, fat isn't the only nutrient you can keep in your diet and still lose weight. One of the biggest myths I get about carbs is that you must omit them from your diet to lose weight or my body doesn't digest them well and I have to omit them because I never lose weight unless I restrict myself. 
That's not true. And it's just not sustainable. It's almost impossible to have a no-carb diet. Fruits and vegetables are known as carbohydrates, and we must get those for their nutrients. Why carbs have a bad name? It's because of the simple carbs. The carbs that you see pre-packaged that are the cookies, the cakes, the sodas, the potato chips, they're called simple carbs because the chemical structure of them is usually one to two glucose molecules put together. So when you have like a small little glucose molecule, it's easy for them to break away. But with our complex carbs, they are really long chains of carbon that are usually about 18 carbon long. And then by the time that your body starts to break it down, it's gonna take a while. And that's exactly what we want because it helps balance our blood sugar. And also that fiber keeps us full for longer and then also prevents us from snacking. So eat your carbs, definitely eat your carbs and eat your bread. Bread's delicious, it's like one of my favorite things. And she has a pro tip for finding bread with more complex carbs. Read your ingredient list. With bread, it's the, a lot of those mass produced breads that are in the bread aisle that are shelf stable. They can last a month without getting mold on them. And when you look at the ingredient list, it's probably about 50 ingredients long. They're the ones we want to avoid. When you're getting bread, get the fresh bread that comes from the local bakery, which is usually around the deli counter area inside in grocery stores. Those will have maybe four or five ingredients. It'll mold after two days, but you can preserve it by just putting it into the freezer and take it out as you need it. And speaking of bread, what about going gluten-free to lose weight? Gluten-free for weight loss can be a huge marketing ploy. So with gluten-free, there are a lot of people that do have an intolerance to gluten or they have celiac disease, which is where the body starts attacking itself and can deteriorate the body. But there are also people without these conditions who are looking to... Blame something like the gluten without checking the rest of their diet. If you are honest with yourself, recording your food, checking the ingredients, and then you eat the gluten and you feel the intolerance, then great but a lot of people will choose to just jump in and being like, gluten's the enemy. So most of us don't need to cut out gluten or fat or carbs to lose weight, but there are some products better left on the shelf. The diet sodas are terrible with all the added those preservatives in them and the hidden sugars. A lot of the added sugars or the synthetic sugars that are supposed to be great because they don't release insulin, which then doesn't cause a spike in blood sugar levels. But internally, if we don't stimulate the release of insulin, those sugars, the synthetic sugars, go to the liver, build up around the liver, hinder the functioning of the liver, and then can lead to non-alcoholic fatty disease. If I'm gonna have a soda, which I have once in a blue moon, it will be the real thing. Yes, there's more sugar in it, but it's something that I don't have on a regular basis. Better yet, she says, drink water. Jazz up your water, add fruit to it. Add some mint or cucumber, lemon. Yes, it'll take a little bit for your taste buds to reset, but you're getting so many nutrients from that water and your body requires water for it to function optimally. Water is one of the six nutrients that the body needs. And when we're dehydrated, it also mimics the signs of hunger. So people turn to food a lot if they're dehydrated, not realizing that they're not hungry. It's just your body saying, give me some water, I'm thirsty. And what about juice? Oh, juice cleanses. <laughs> so juice cleanses are like one of my pet peeves. If you're having a juice every once in a while, great. You're still getting the antioxidants out of it. You're still getting the nutrients, but you're removing that fiber and fiber is key for the body to support gut health. With a lot of juice cleanses, they're hella expensive, and we have this belief that they're gonna be better for our bodies, or it's a cleansing effect of our body. Realistically, what's happening is that when you have those juice cleanses, they're mostly coming from like fruit sugars, and then the vegetable sugars, it's a high, high amount of fructose in the body. When the body consumes excess fructose, it has a spasming effect of the GI tract. That can lend to the cleansing effect. So that when we are actually having a reaction to the high amounts of fructose in the body, people think it's the cleansing effect because the marketing ploys have led us to believe that way. But it's not. You would be better cleansing your body by actually eating the apple, eating the spinach, and eating all the other fruits that are in that cleanse. That would be better for you because 
Fiber is our natural detox. What it does is it goes through the body, picks up like excess fat, metabolic waste, and help cleanse it out. But juice cleanses aren't the only diet fads that don't often work. Intermittent fasting is probably a question I get all the time. It's, we can kind of put in that myth category. Now, it can restrict calories and at least temporarily help you lose weight. If you're only allowed to eat food for eight hours, that just gives someone a lot of structure, and that can be very, very helpful. You can only get so many calories in your mouth in that time. Uh, on the flip side, someone can get a lot of calories in their mouth during that time as well. So someone can, and I've seen many people do it, they've gained weight through intermittent fasting, so it's not just gonna be this quick fix, there's nothing magical to it. And the same goes for many popular diets. So one of the common diets right now that is um, gaining popularity is the ketogenic diet. So a lot of people who are doing that are just eliminating carbohydrates, which is why that's hard to sustain because your body does need carbohydrates for a reason. To be honest, there's not a lot of research that's saying that that is something that is helpful. There's maybe a lot of research in mice models, but that hasn't been transcribed into human studies. And while people have lost weight on keto, it's often not without side effects. They're eliminating whole grains and legumes, um, certain fruits and vegetables, um, and really increasing their um, fat intake, which although fats are important, excess of any nutrient can cause metabolic changes in your body that will impact your cardiovascular health, your physical health, your metabolic health. So an example would be patients that we're seeing in the clinical setting are following ketogenic diets, are seeing weight loss, however, are coming with higher cholesterol markers, they are coming with higher LDL markers, they're coming with more irritable bowel symptoms, um, they're coming with more gastrointestinal discomfort. The truth is, there's no one tool that will make you magically lose weight. I think the most prevalent um, concept around health these days is biohacking, which is this idea that you can defeat biology, you can work around your um, genetic predispositions, your metabolic parameters, and that is actually not true. And the reason for that is because you cannot defeat biology. You cannot um, hack hunger, you cannot hack access to healthcare, you cannot hack motivation. And this idea that, you know, again, if those results are there, you're going to um, be able to feel more satisfied is also not true. So this biohacking works on this concept and this belief that you know you can work your way and you know fix your body and that prescribes to the social construct that it is up to you to change that. And that's also why most diets don't work. They're hard to sustain, they're hard to maintain, so the results are very temporary, which is why we go back to something, trying something new. It's important to focus on behaviors rather than outcomes. Where you should start is record your food. A simple food log to lose weight, it's really just being honest with yourself, identifying your foods and the hidden ingredients that could be contributing to excess of hundreds and hundreds of calories per day. Take olive oil. Olive oil is great, but when we cook with it, we usually free pour it into a pan. Each tablespoon of olive oil has 128 calories. Now, if you're pouring in like six, seven, eight tablespoons with your vegetables, you're getting almost like a thousand calories that you don't need. So, pro tip for cooking with olive oil. Put it in, wait till your, pot, your pan is hot. Once it's hot, add one to two tablespoons of olive oil, and then add in your vegetables. When the pan is hot enough, it will disperse easier, and then you'll use less. Also, once you put the vegetables in, some water and moisture will come from those vegetables and will add to the liquid in the pan. So you actually don't need to add excess in. And if you are being mindful of what you eat, that whole idea of cheating, Kearney isn't a fan. I don't think there is any cheat meals. I don't like the word cheat. I think it gives it this, it gives us this like higher power, like, oh, this is really bad. And, you know, I can't believe I did this. I completely fell off the wagon. No, remove that because then you're going to want it more. You're going to feel even more guilty about it. If you go out, you're socializing, you're trying out one of New York's like best restaurants that's filled with cream and butter, enjoy it. Just try to get a salad to start and filling up on salad is a great way to cut the calories. And then have like one of the appetizers that are not in line with your health goals with your table and share, because sharing is caring. And there's more good news. 
you can still lose weight while drinking occasional alcohol if you're sticking to the cleaner foods. And by omitting all the foods that you tend to enjoy in the past, by omitting alcohol, trying to increase your exercise, and then doing this like detox, fad, all in one go, it's overwhelming and it's setting you up for failure. So doing it in stages and being more realistic about what you can change now and then work towards it. But what I usually uh, recommend to my clients is take care of your food now. Understand how your body feels when it's nourished. Understand like how your gut health is supposed to be supported. And then we'll focus on alcohol and working in the exercise. But the thing is, no matter how much we care about it, weight definitely isn't everything. I think one of the biggest myths around weight loss and weight is that overweight equals unhealthy, normal weight equals healthy as defined by the BMI category. BMI is a very inaccurate measure of health because it is just looking at your height and weight um, without taking into account what your metabolic factors and parameters are, what is your physiological health, your physical health, your sleep, your mental health, your relationship to food, um, you know, and, and I think it's very important to factor those things if you really want to define someone, you know, as healthy. And if we're not going to look at it more holistically, um, I think what that does is it marginalizes people in bigger bodies. Plus, not everyone can lose weight, even if they're putting in the same effort. That's a very common myth that everybody should have, should, has the same ability to lose weight and if all, everybody eats the same way, they're going to look the same way, which is very untrue and that's incorrect. And the reason for that is I think it's important to understand that someone's weight is a factor of so many different things. It is so complex all the way from your genetic predispositions, your past, um, your family history, your past medical history your um, you know, relationship to food as you're growing up because not everybody has access to food because health is about inclusion, access, connection, joy, uh, physiological well-being and we have to take those factors into account. So the myth that all neat freaks have OCD is a common one. Most people who are clean just actually care about being clean and that's totally different than having OCD. Also there are no five stages of loss. It's just a myth. That's Laura Gorin. One of three psychologists we brought into our studios to debunk some of the most common mental health myths. So the myth that most people with schizophrenia have multiple personalities, that was a very old way that it was understood and it's been proven to not be true. So with, with schizophrenia, it's not another personality. What it is though, is a break with reality and a part of ourselves, maybe for instance, that believes that someone is out to get them. Okay, so that's a really common one with, with schizophrenia. So the myth that all neat freaks have OCD is a common one. It's, it seems like it's almost a popular cultural thing that people say to each other, you have OCD when somebody is like organizing their bag. And in reality, OCD itself, the, the illness has different components and one of the subsets is the, the keeping things organized and clean, but it has to be at an obsessive level where people are thinking about it all the time. And so that itself is really uncommon. Most people who are clean just actually care about being clean. And that's totally different than having OCD. Bipolar disorder is not simply mood swings. It's a very high elevation of uh, maybe a positive mood and a very low negative mood. Uh, everybody has mood swings, but with bipolar disorder, it, it's not just that. It, it's you know severe forms of you know elevated mood or depressed mood, and they cycle through that. And so sometimes it could be shown as symptoms of like a manic episode. It might be somebody like hypersexuality or not sleeping at all and things like that. It's not simply feeling good. This is a common myth, and I hear people throw this one around a lot too. Anxiety itself is thinking, 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 and it, just imagine yourself going into the worry thoughts of what if, what if, what if this happens, what if that happens, and it's unremitting, and it goes on for hours for some people, sometimes it's more passing for others, but being stressed out about something, as humans, we're wired to be to handle stressors, and we've been dealing with an onslaught of stressors since the beginning of time. You know, going to work, taking the subway, a coming in contact with other people, you know, that, that can be stressful, that can be stress inducing. Unless you have an actual like panic attack while you're taking the subway, that would be more of an anxiety reaction, whereas the stress of taking the subway is more stress-based. You know, everybody feels anxious, let's say, before a presentation or, you know, before an exam. But an anxiety disorder is the extreme form of that where it becomes, you know, it interferes with somebody's daily functioning. This is actually a really important myth. 
Sadness is an ephemeral reaction to something. It's an emotion by, by definition lasts a few seconds. It can last like 10 minutes, but on average, we have an emotion, it passes, and then we have another emotion. The thing that tends to bring us from sadness to depression is rumination, which means thinking and thinking and thinking about the thing over and over and over again. And that's how we then go from sadness to depression, but it's not an immediate thing. We all have moments of sadness and we just, we just allow them and let them pass. We tend to be okay. Okay, but if we get caught up in getting ruminating and thinking about all the reasons why we're sad, that's when we tend to go into depression. So to the myth that depression is not a real illness, it is a real illness and in fact it can be incredibly debilitating. In order to classify as having depression, we have to have some kind of a lethargic kind of behavior where we have trouble getting out of bed. I mean there are different there are different ways of depression, but one of the primary ones is has this kind of what they're called neurovegetative symptoms, like where we can't sleep, where we can't eat. There's also a kind of depression which is this thymia, which has an anhedonia component into it, which means less pleasure in things that we used to enjoy, which is another kind of depression. And a lot of people will describe like, oh, I used to love pottery and now I can't even like, I can't even look at pots, you know, like something just totally changes for them um, when they're deeply in this, in this state of depression. Talking about painful things that you've learned how to sort of cover over can initially be more painful, but in the interests of working out things that, if not dealt with straightforwardly, are gonna come back to bite them. I'll say an, another thing about that is that sometimes patients wonder, what's the therapist gonna feel if I say thus and so? Like, can the therapist handle the level of despair that I sometimes feel? And on those occasions when the patient has the strength to put it out there and see how the therapist responds, the fact that the therapist can, can handle it is a big step toward the patient then being able to handle it. There are reasons, and they may change over time, but I think the thing that I would want to debunk in that respect is the idea that there's a single reason, so that if you, if you handle that, then you're going to be freed of that. And there's, there's not. In most cases, there's not. You've got to discover the reasons in the plural that you're depressed and what you can do something about and what you can't. The myth that only women get depressed couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, however, women are twice as likely to experience depression. So the reason why oftentimes people think women have a higher uh, rate of depression than men is because of maybe hormonal changes, life circumstances, and stress. The other thing that I like to think about is uh, that women uh, might uh, express their feelings in a different way than men do. So sometimes men might you know, act out behaviorally, whereas women might focus on their internal experience. and so they might be more likely to see a therapist if that's the case. When people have gone down the road of eventually deciding to go on medications um, for anti antidepressants, they don't change your personality, they change the symptoms of depression. They can also work for anxiety. So typically if we have just typical symptoms of depression and anxiety, we'll be given an antidepressant is what it's called, an SSRI and that will help us regulate the symptoms of our just up and down of moods. And the way I describe it to people is, it's like going back to your baseline you when it's the right medication, but it doesn't change your personality. Your personality, you're you. So in terms of the myth that we'll always be cured um, from depression by antidepressants, the research shows that the most effective thing right now for depression is actually um, therapy and then for people who need antidepressants, therapy and antidepressants together are, are another effective form and it doesn't, not everybody has to take it. So even with people who are taking antidepressants, it's important to still be in therapy. The myth that bad parenting causes mental illness I think is a trap because parents are all too ready to take responsibility and to feel guilty about all sorts of problems that their children have. So there's no point in reinforcing that and harming and damaging the mental health of parents. If you think that your parents caused your mental illness, you're gonna end up endlessly complaining about your parent. What can you do about the way you were raised? You can do something about what it's left you with in the present. Around LGBT adults and, and youth, there's so many myths associated with, with um, mental health. And, and a big part of it, I think, is unfortunately because the profession that I'm in had a really dirty history along these lines. And the, in the DSM, which is our Diagnostic Statistic Manual, until 1973, 
homosexuality was actually listed as, as a disorder. And um, after a lot of pushback and studies and, and LGBTQ kind of rights being integrated into, into theory, we realized that that was really outdated. And since then, in DSM-3, it stopped being, and unless somebody has specific anxiety related to being gay, then they're not d diagnosed ever with a mental health related disorder associated with it. The same is true for being trans, actually. That, um, it's only if somebody has what's called like dysphoria, where they, they don't like their body, that they then have a diagnosis. But just being trans in and of itself isn't a disorder anymore. You know, so the question about what role mental health plays in the attacks of gun violence, unfortunately, that's been a mischaracterization of people who have severe mental illness, is that they're more likely to commit crimes and with guns. It's not that people with mental illness are more likely to be aggressive, it's the people who commit these crimes have access to guns and they tend to be really self-loathing. Like that's kind of the primary thing that makes people have a lack of empathy. That seems to be the things that make them be more violent and aggressive. Those are better predictors than any type of mental health disorder. People talk about a whole town, like on the news, a whole town was traumatized by the shooting, for instance, right? And it doesn't work that way. And that's actually one of the most common um, mental health disorders that I have seen mischaracterized in that particular particular way is PTSD. People seem to think that by virtue of having experienced a potentially traumatic event that you'll have these particular realm of symptoms that include hypervigilance, there's impulsivity, there, there's so many different realms of what comes up for people after trauma and I've heard people say, you know, because I was traumatized, because I was there on 9-11 for instance. Well, a whole city was there and we have really good numbers about the number of people who ended up having PTSD and they're actually really small. When something like this happens, um, a major tragedy like a gun shooting or a, you know, 9-11 or any other type of tragedy like that, people tend to be resilient. There's a big myth actually even within the mental health field saying that there are prototypical ways to respond to grief and loss and that's in pop culture as well that people have these ideas that there's one way to grieve and if we're not devastated and deeply traumatized that somehow we're, we're in denial or unfeeling. And that's not true. In fact, since the beginning of time, we've been dealing with death. We have different ways of dealing with it. And sometimes, sometimes we're relieved that the person dies because we didn't have a very good relationship with them. Or even if the person, if we love them and we feel really connected to them, but they were sick, we're relieved that they're dead because we don't want them to suffer anymore. People tend to feel really guilty about being relieved after a death, which is a very common reaction to death. There are no five stages of loss. It's just a myth. And it's one of the most popular myths out there. And it's one of those things where people who aren't very psychologically minded will come in and say, oh my gosh, I must be in the denial phase of loss, or I must be in this phase because I'm not, you know, I'm not dealing with it yet. In reality, I just think it's one of those things that makes us feel safe. Like if we can imagine these stages are ahead of us, then we can feel better about where we are. And so I think that's why it's so popular. However, I've seen the flip side, which is why it can be damaging when people have losses and they're judging themselves for not having this prototypical series of, of stages and they're not based on reality or evidence or anything. Okay, so people are gonna hate me for saying this, but, and, and this is so common in the um, dating world, like people, if you ever look on people's profiles, on dating profiles, they always say like, I am an NYFB, or I don't even know what they say, <laughs> but it's always about how, how there are these certain, you know, Myers-Briggs score, and it's really popular these days, Myers-Briggs, and in fact, a lot of organizations use it and really, you know, base a lot of their testing on it. Again, there's no validation around any of these studies, and so while it might resonate for people and that is something that you know just like when we talk about you know I'm a, I'm a Gemini because I do this you know it resonates for you the idea of being a Gemini and you might act in ways that remind you of this description of what it is to be a Gemini but there are no empirical tests to say that you are such this thing there are personality tests but Myers-Briggs isn't one of them the myth that therapy is going to be exclusively about the past or predominantly about the past and not help you in your current life or not give you a form for talking about what's happening today and yesterday. There's a reason why people hold on to that myth. And the reason is that there was a, an early version of psychoanalysis that held 
to the idea that people's personalities were formed in their first five years and that the past was strongly formative of the present. It sometimes can be helpful to say that there was a pattern that was established in relation to people in the past. And that can give you some perspective on what's happening in the present. So making reference to the past is not necessarily a bad thing, but it should never be because this happened, therefore you're having this problem now. It's not an explanation. It's only a way of getting perspective on the present. I think oftentimes people might say, oh, why not go speak with a friend who's a good friend and they can keep things confidential. But uh, therapists are trained to work in a particular way to help people deal with uh, specific problems they're facing. Therapists are uh, different than friends because even though your friends uh, might be willing to, for example, hold a secret, therapists uh, really treat things in a very confidential manner and they're willing to explore things that maybe a friend would be uncomfortable exploring. Actually, the fact is that most people who come to therapy are among the stronger people. And the reason is because they have the courage and the, the strength to look at themselves, which is not an easy thing to do in various ways. I think it's because the people who come to me are people who've already decided to work on themselves. Good therapists don't force their patients to talk about something they don't want to talk about. To the contrary, I think that even encouraging a person to talk about something that they're not ready to talk about is counterproductive. The problem with hitting pain points right on the head is privacy, for one thing. People are entitled to their privacy. Therapy isn't just an opportunity to spill. So I think having people's privacy, when their privacy is respected, that makes them more confident to open up, actually. But the other problem for that is that the therapist needs to be thinking that there's a limit to the tolerance of everybody, including the therapist, for how much pain they can tolerate at any given time. And so respect for people's anxiety about getting into some of the more difficult things in their lives is also part of the process. Psychiatrists are the only ones who are able in this country to prescribe medication. They do a, what's called a psychopharmological consult where they will go through all of your history. And that's something they do if you want that. And I say if you want that because it's really important. As a psychologist, for instance, we always try therapy first. It's like it's the treatment of preference for all all clinicians. In fact, they've done all these studies that have shown that therapy first for several months before you then even think about a medication is the best course of treatment for people because that way you can really see what is what and if you then still want to do medications it's certainly something you can talk about but but you don't have to do medications it's up to you and your therapist to if you if, if it feels like that would be beneficial to you I, I would not say that most therapists consider that therapy has to go on forever but I think when you're interviewing somebody and considering them to be your therapist, that's one thing to ask about. How do you think about how long this should, this should go on? And when do you start to think that maybe it's time to end it? How do you break up with your therapist? Do not break up with your therapist in an email or a text or a phone message. You've got to be direct. You've got to say, I've been thinking that maybe it's time for us to stop. But then, that can't be the end of it. If you haven't already said it, hopefully you have already said it in one way or another in the preceding sessions. What I've been looking for is this, and I see how it's been happening in my life, and maybe give an example or two. But it's not like you feel you have to convince the therapist. I want to uh, be sure to let people know that there are l lots of ways of getting good psychotherapy at a reduced fee. So there are institutes where people get advanced training beyond their doctorate. And all those institutes have training clinics where people are treated at a low fee. And some people might think that the higher the fee, the more skilled the practitioner, which is not necessarily the case. But certainly in that case, it's not true. 